All right, so if there are any more questions, then I'll move ahead and introduce our first speaker of the morning. Uh, this is Dr. Salma Kasim, who's coming to us from um, Ryan Uline's group uh, at the City University of New York. And she's gonna be talking to us about her work on systems peptide chemistry. She obtained her bachelor's and master's from the University of Geneva, and then did a PhD with uh, David Lee at the University of Manchester, where she worked on this in the area of molecular motors uh, and developing molecular motors for transport and synthesis of small molecules. And then she stayed on in, in Lee's group and did work on developing um, molecular motors that could control the stereospecific synthesis of, um, of, of molecules. And then in 2019, joined uh, Professor Ryan Ulyan's group um, at, at CUNY and has been working on the discovery of new properties of self-assembling structures using dynamic peptide libraries. And uh, today she's gonna to be talking to us about the approaches for in situ emergence of functionality in peptide-based systems. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction and uh, the invitation here today and tomorrow. Um, this is a different kind of meeting for me, and I am very excited to hear from all the speakers over the, um, the next couple of days. So uh, I am not an astrobiologist. I'm an organic synthetic chemistry, um, uh, the chemist, sorry. Um, but I think uh, from uh, Vic's introduction, uh, the work that uh, the Ulan group is doing um, is, is very relevant to, to the theme. And I hope that you, you'll be able to see that. So today I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work that has been done in the group on the theme, and I move on to what uh, I'm currently uh, doing. So a lot of the work has been done by um, other uh, uh, PhDs and, and postdocs um, in the group. Um, so what we, can you see my mouse? So um, our group is interested in minimalistic peptide design. Um, so you'll see this uh, kind of presentation, uh, representation throughout the talk. And these are the 20 gene encoded amino acids. And we color code them depending on their functionality. And uh, what we're trying to build is take these amino acids, dipeptides, tripeptides, et cetera, and build up functionality with just the minimum amount required. Um, so um, there are two aspects. Um, so when we think about how um, proteins evolved from amino acids, um, the most important aspect of this is how amino acids self-organize and interact within each other to build up complexity and to build up defined structures. But these defined structures have to have functionality. So it's kind of the merger of these two aspects that we're really interested in. How can we build up define structures from amino acids, at the same time, have them have functionality. And so I'll talk about uh, a little bit about both um, aspects and how they can merge um, and come together. So the concept of structure, obviously we're talking about nanostructures, um, like peptides that can form, or small uh, uh, peptides that can form uh, fibers or nanoparticles, et cetera. And also we're talking about um, specific functionality and adaptive functionality a little bit. Right, so um, this is the chart of the 20 amino acids that we, we use and were inspired from and color coded depending on their function. So in purple, you have the aromatics, in blue, basic, et cetera, as the legend is showing. Uh, and uh, you'll see throughout the talk representation of these of two circles coming together. This represents dipeptides, or you'll see them as, um, you know, connected with the swiggly uh, bond, uh, with the swiggly line, which represents the backbone. As the backbone will be the wiggly bond and then um, the amino acids in these circles. Um, and so in, in peptide design, there are two uh, kind of competing aspects usually, uh, or we like to think about them as competing. Um, there is the backbone interaction that gives protein their stable folds. So if you have beta sheets, alpha helices, usually it's backbone-backbone interaction that dictates this 
structure. But we also have side chain interactions and side chain is what gives um, a lot of proteins their function. Now, usually side chain interactions give you disordered structures and backbone interactions give you ordered structures. Now, ordered structures are not as flexible and dynamic and adaptable as side chain interactions. So we're really trying to marry the two and merge both of them so that we get a little bit of order, but we get disorder because we need disorder for functionality. Um, so our approach is a systems-based approach, um, which means that we look at thing at different components and how they come together and interact together. So rather than look at a single peptide or a single molecule, we look at a set of small molecules and apply different conditions and see how their interaction changes and what new functions come out of the different uh, environments. And now a lot of the, the, the bulk work is in the analysis. How do you analyze complex systems like this um, when you don't know what the outcome is going to be? Um, so there is, um, we analyze product distribution, we analyze nanostructures um, and we do, uh, we change the conditions and do repeated uh, analysis. Um, and that's like the, um, how the, I, I would say the one of the main challenges of systems chemistry is to be able to fully understand and analyze your complex mixture. A lot of the time, what we're looking at is a targeted search. So uh, we anticipate what the outcome is going to be and see if it happens. So you match, um, your experimental results with something that is predicted to see if it did happen. But the, the, this is, I think you're only seeing half of what you actually have. And it is in what we do, we still do targeted search, but I do think there is um, a need to do, to develop tools for untargeted um, searches. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain what that means um, in, a few, in a few minutes. Um, so um, the, we like to think that in the group, this idea of dynamic peptide libraries started with this uh, project who was done by a, um, a PhD in the group uh, at the time, uh, Babis, um, who um, their idea was to take dipeptides. So you see them here as these um, two little spheres. So there are two amino acids um, together. And uh, what we can use, we can use enzymes. So uh, we can use peptidases to connect these dipeptides and form longer oligomers. So you, you, um, the one that we use at the moment is thermolysin, which is an endopeptidase. And all we need is that on the N terminus, we have a hydrophobic amino acid. That's all we need. On the C terminus, it can be anything. And so what the, uh, what the enzyme is going to do is if you have a pool of these um, dipeptides, is gonna make a longer oligomer. So it's gonna make bonds between these dipeptides, but it can also break them. So it means it can go towards longer products and then go back towards smaller products. And what this allows you to achieve is a thermodynamic equilibrium where everything is in equilibrium and only the most stable products or the favorite products are being made. And this is what this um, kind of sheet is trying to represent so the different um, peptide length and mixtures are all sitting in diff at different heights. So this is their uh, energy. Uh, and the, they're all, because we're only under thermodynamic equilibrium, they can exchange. So you can make them and break them and only the really stable ones or the favorite one in your conditions um, are gonna be uh, amplified. Uh, and so, as I said, this is a very, um, it's a versatile method because all you need is an N-terminus on, uh, sorry, a hydrophobic N-terminus. And so you can um, use uh, any dipeptides that you want. So in this particular example, um, the C-terminus was changed to um, uh, hydrophobic, so aliphatic for, and uh, to aromatic and then to polar amino acids. Um, and different conditions were tested to see what mixtures survive or what mixtures are favored in each condition. Uh, so the uh, identification of the, the uh, product is done by LCMS. So um, 
liquid chromatography coupled to a mass uh, spectrometry. Uh, and so what you get is, as I said, a complex mixture of everything that you have in the system. So how can you identify uh, what you're actually making? So we create databases of all possible products that we can think of uh, using a software called TraceFinder. Uh, and then we input uh, the experimental uh, LCMS into the software. And what the software does, it matches molecular weight and fragmentation patterns to the database that we've generated and tells you what you're actually, what you're actually making. Um, so as I said, it's a targeted search. If anything has been made that is not in your database, you won't see it in, in using this method. Um, so um, you studied a couple of systems. So starting from um, just uh, using um, the same amino acids, so dilucine here, we're seeing the conversion um, plots. Um, so starting with dilucine, um, if you look at the conversion in the system and what emerges, you see very clearly that there is one particular peptide that um, emer emerges significantly, and this is L6. So you have six repeats of leucine, but because you start with, di with dilucine, that's like three units coming together. And then all the other numbers that you'd expect to make, they do appear, but they're not, oops, sorry. They're not made, um, they're not uh, as favored as um, L6. Uh, the same is true for phenylalanine. So starting from uh, diphenylalanine, you see that the conversion is mainly uh, favoring uh, F6, so six uh, amino acid peptides. Um, now, for uh, tryptophan, an amino acid like tryptophan, is actually not the W6 that is uh, more favored, it's actually W4. Um, so it's, uh, th this is the, the product formation is not driven by the length, but driven by what forms the most stable structure. So with different amino acids, we can get different length peptides. Uh, now, this is all interesting, but what, what if we just mix amino acids? So um, here, um, they, uh, I was took uh, leucine, leucine, and phen phenylalanine, phenylalanine. So the two different dipeptides mixed them together and looked at what uh, would happen. And he started testing different experimental conditions. So the first, the top one, is just in phosphate buffer. Uh, and so the top line represents all the different uh, possible uh, products that you can form. And as you can see in phosphate buffer, nothing really stands out. Everything is kind of formed in low yield without a, a, a preference. Now you start putting um, organic solvents, for example, 10% uh, um, THF, and um, you favor F6. So um, you favor the formation of these F6 uh, because you have the hydrophobic effect coming into uh, play here. If you change the conditions a little bit and start adding some salts, you change the product distribution. So you start making um, uh, F2L2, which is a hybrid uh, tetrapeptide. Um, and then he introduced um, tryptophan, tryptophan in the mixture, and again, started changing the conditions. So um, in phosphate buffer, there are low yields, everything is kind of made in the same um, yield. And then you start introducing organic solvents such as THF and acetonitrile. And each time you get a different product distribution. Now, the molecular, uh, on the molecular level, um, it was a little bit difficult to explain for each case why you have a different product distribution. But the take home message is that the environmental conditions have a huge impact on your product distribution. So you can't just mix thick dipeptides. If you mix them in one solvent system, is the, the, the distribution is gonna be different than if you take them and mix them in another solvent system. Um, or you can think of salts as guests. So um, that the mixture is reacting differently in the presence of guests. So they took this idea and we decided to explore other guests or metabolites. And this is the uh, work of Dr. Uh, Ankit Jain, who um, took, again, this idea of dipeptides and decided to mix them with ATP and see what happens. Um, so the idea is 
uh, again, just take ATP on the end terminus, you have hydrophobics. In this case, he changed the hydrophobics and we'll talk a little bit about that. So glycine, aline and valine. And on the C terminus, he decided to put amino acids that could bind to ATP via electrostatic uh, interaction. Uh, so arginine and lysine uh, and histidine and then other uh, amino acids that we're not expecting them to have a big role just to show that you have preference for things that can interact with ATP. Uh, and so uh, we put all these uh, dipeptides uh, in presence of ATP and without ATP to compare it. So the, the experiment without ATP is kind of a control or a blank or to see how the system would behave if there was no ATP. And then you compare it uh, to uh, when you introduce um, a metabolite or a guest such as um, ATP. Um, so the representations that I'm going to be using um, to describe this work look like this. These are heat maps. And what these represent um, is uh, we're talking about the, we're only looking here at the formation of tetrapeptides. So only one, uh, uh, one bond is made by the enzyme. Uh, we could look for bigger, but tetrapeptides is really where all the yield is. And um, when you uh, uh, analyze this through trace finder, it gives you a, a matrix of um, the area under the peak for each tetrapeptide. Um, so for example, here uh, in a mixture where you have, um, sorry, uh, five dipeptides, you can generate a, a matrix here of all the possible tetrapeptides that you make. And how this is read is um, if you have, uh, so the tetrapeptide GR, GR, then uh, that's the first uh, square here. If you have GK, GR, that's the second square here, et cetera, et cetera. So you like have this matrix of all your possible tetrapeptides. And the, uh, the color represents the area under the peak of each um, tetrapeptide. So you can get an idea of what tetrapeptides are made preferentially. Um, so, um, this is a, a, a the evolution um, uh, through time of um, this system. So um, this is for the valine library. So um, at the top, um, at the top three, uh, sorry, the top six squares are of the um, reactions in the presence of ATP, and then the bottom ones are without ATP. And so this is like a concentration gradient. And at the bottom here, we have the difference between the two. So plus ATP minus ATP to see what really, what the effect of ATP is. So I'll walk you through some of the uh, observations here. So as you can see at the beginning, both reactions are kind of look similar. The distribution of product is um, quite similar. But as you uh, kind of move from day four, six and eight, you start in, in the ATP uh, case, you start seeing a buildup of, um, these products that are uh, here, so these little squares. And when you look at the composition of um, these tetrapeptides, you see that they're components of VR, VK, and VH. So these are the ones that we're anticipating that they're going to bind to ATP. Whereas the rest um, is kind of, uh, the distribution uh, is identical between ATP and uh, without ATP. And this is more uh, obvious when you do the difference uh, map where again here you can see this blue square um, of sequences that are amplified in presence of ATP. Um, and the, uh, in yellow, it shows you the sequences that remain the same or are downregulated. So this, these heat maps show clearly the buildup of sequences that are interacting with ATP and how the presence of a, a guest um, or a metabolite can influence the distribution of your system. Um, and so um, we looked at specific um, sequences and how um, they evolve. Um, so here uh, are um, just uh, uh, three examples of um, tetrapeptide, VK, VH, VS, VD, VRBS. And the idea here is to uh, compare something that is that we know has a strong binding to um, ATP, VK, VH, to something that doesn't have a strong binding to ATP. So this is here the reaction without ATP, and this is the evolution of each of these tetrapeptides through time. And you can see that without ATP, there is no preference. All the, the all three tetrapeptides are kind of made in the same uh, yield. 
Uh, but in the presence of ATP, you see this huge, um, this huge uh, amplification or the uh, formation of VKVH, showing clearly the preference of the systems to make these kind, uh, these kind of tetrapeptides. Um, and you can see um, some structures appearing uh, by TM. Um, so this is actually of the reaction mixture. So um, you have some small fibers that um, appear. But then when you have ATP, you start seeing these um, small kind of nanoparticles. And we believe that these are actually um, some of the tetrapeptides are forming that are binding to ATP and forming these uh, nanostructures. Um, and so this, this whole, um, the, the other thing, sorry, to point out is um, you can see that here, for example, is we, if you look at VRVS, you start it starts building up, but the yield kind of remains the same. So it just is in thermodynamic equilibrium. Whereas in with ATP, it starts forming, but then um, the enzyme breaks it down. So what the enzyme is doing is actually forming all these possible tetrapeptides, but the ones that are not binding to ATP because there is no use for them, it breaks them down and they go back to the, um, to the uh, dipeptide state. So the enzyme is also the activity of the enzyme and the product distribution is clearly adapting to the presence of um, the metabolite. So not only just amplifying the binding ones, but downregulating the non-binding sequences. Um, and so um, Anke really went uh, a step further with this and he makes um, 25 <laughs> amino acids in the same plot, which was like, everyone thought he was you know, crazy for doing that because the analysis would have been just impossible because of the number we have 225 possible tetrapeptides. This is just tetrapeptides, but he did it and he managed to analyze it. Uh, and so I just want to, to give him credit on this uh, beautiful, beautiful work that he did. Um, and so um, this is a heat map of the difference um, at uh, 37 degrees. So what we've been talking about so far, sorry, I forgot to mention, um, is um, for the uh, V library, this is at 60 degrees. But let's see uh, what happens at 37 degrees. So uh, uh, this is like the optimum, well, not the optimum, but sort of where you want to be working for the enzyme activity. Um, and so the difference map here shows us that the sequences that are getting amplified are actually, um, if you look here, they're mainly in the in the glycine area. So you have um, uh, the way it's uh, structured is you have the glycine uh, tetrapeptides, so the less ordered or the less structured or the less self-assembling. And then you have alanine, a little bit more self-assembling. And then you have valine, which is a lot more uh, obviously hydrophobic and self-assembling. And so at 37 degrees, um, you're kind of favoring um, non-self-assembling um, um, sequences, again, in the GR, GKGH uh, area, but they're mainly with glycines. And what happens when you start raising the temperature is you start favoring self-assembling um, um, uh, libraries. So you clearly here see the difference that this moves into valine, more valine uh, heavy um, uh, sequences. Um, and so, even not, not only does the system adapt to the presence of a metabolite, but also adapts um, to temperature. Um, so just changing the temperature, you can have a whole different um, distribution of product based on uh, structural um, organization. All right, so um, this was um, for the ATP story. And once, once we had that, we really started thinking, how can we, what can we do next? How can we take this and apply it to, or can we take this and apply it to any metabolite we want? How um, applicable is this, um, is this methodology? Uh, and so when I joined the group, I had a particular interest in carbohydrate uh, chemistry or carbohydrate binding um, uh, peptides. Uh, so we started looking at uh, glucose binding sites in lectins and um, my colleague Scott uh, McPhee um, pulled up uh, about 200 lectins from the PDB, and uh, he started uh, analyzing the binding sites and look at what are the amino acids that surround glucose in the binding sites of lectins. Um, so this um, chart here represents the um, 
amino acid frequency and lectin. So how many times a specific amino acid is present um, uh, in those hundred and I think it was 140 uh, structures. Uh, but what he also looked at is how far are these amino acids from the glucose binding site? Because this will just give you a general idea of what amino acids are present, but they don't tell you where they are um, exactly. And this is important because usually uh, when you talk about sugar binding, um, this is the model that a lot of people describe. So you have at the top and bottom, you have aromatic surfaces that do CH by interactions. And then on the sides, you have polar spacers that do hydrogen bonding. Um, so we wanted to see if actually these two type of interactions are reflected in the PDB. This is a, a synthetic model for synthetic glucose receptors, but we wanted to see if nature does the same thing. And we think it does. So um, this chart here, I took, or, or Scott took, sorry, the uh, most uh, prominent polar amino acids that are present around glucose, so aspartic acid and uh, aspargine. And he plotted their distribution with growing distance from the glucose. And so you can see that around between two and three angstrom, you see a huge increase of the number of aspartic acids. Uh, and the same is true for aspargine. Um, and also, also, I wanted to see how the aromat, where, where do the aromatics start coming in? Uh, because the distances for CH pi can be a bit uh, bigger than the distances for hydrogen bonding. And it turns out that, um, for example, phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan start appearing much later at much longer distances from the glucose uh, than the polar ones. So you kind of see these two regimes, one that does hydrogen bonding at between two and three angstrom. And then after 3.5 angstrom, you start seeing the, hydro the aromatic coming in. Now, one exception to that is histidine. If you can see it here, it's kind of considered or appears at the same time as um, the hydrogen bonding uh, amino acids. Uh, and so I found this extremely uh, interesting because I don't think anyone has looked at this problem in this way. Um, and this gives you not only information about what amino acids are present in binding sites, but also what is the function of each amino acid. Um, and this has helped us a lot in this um, idea of can we, can we make, can we put glucose in presence of our dipeptides and like what, what interactions can we expect to be looking at? Um, and so this is uh, unpublished results and uh, very preliminary, but what I did was I took, um, uh, dipeptides. So I'm working with alanine. So um, alanine aspartic, uh, so I'm omitting the alanine here, but alanine aspartic acid, alanine histidine, alanine aspargine. This is again, this heat map representation of um, tetrapeptides. So for example, AD, AD is um, um, this uh, square here, and then AH, AD is this square here, et cetera. And what I'm looking at is again, amplification of these tetrapeptides in presence of glucose as compared to in absence of glucose. So um, the, how gray the, um, the square is represents the amplification ratio, which is the area in presence of glucose um, over the area in absence of glucose. And what I did is in, instead of putting everything together from the beginning, I wanted to separate these two kind of um, networks that we're seeing from the PDB. So the hydrogen bonding network at like this 2.5 area that has um, aspartic acid, aspargine and histidine, and then the one where we have tryptophan. Um, so in the um, aspartic acid, histidine and aspargine uh, network, you can see that uh, all the, these um, tetrapeptides have kind of amplified in the same, at the same scale, there is nothing that stands out, uh, which we took to uh, mean that there is cooperativity between all of them. There is amplification, so they are made in more yield as compared to without glucose, but everything is amplified to the same level. Um, if you now take the um, 
one that has uh, tryptophan, so no histidine, you can see that some, um, especially tryptophan containing sequences are a lot more amplified than the rest. And so we, we think this is uh, because it is doing some CH by interactions with the glucose. So we don't have like a 3D kind of map or vision yet of um, the system, but uh, what, what we think is that the two systems are interacting um, in, in different ways uh, with glucose. So one is through hydrogen bonding and one is through hydrogen bonding plus CH by interaction. Now, the interesting thing here is when you mix the two systems, the amplification that you see is kind of as if you've overlaid the two exactly together. That's what I hope you can see here. So this is the mixture where I have all the four together and the amplification is very comparable to as if the two were independent. So what we've managed to do is create a system where you kind of have two different interacting system that coexist at the same time. Um, so um, this is, as I said, uh, kind of preliminary results, and we're looking more into uh, these systems and exactly what the what the players, um, what the important players of these systems are, and also is it just applicable to tryptophan or can we use any uh, aromatic amino acid? Um, so I'm going to move on from. Uh, the dynamic peptide library story to just share with you uh, a new, a new direction or a new, um, a new field that we've been um, working on in the group. So I spoke a little bit at the beginning about this idea of order and disorder that we need disorder for functionality or we need adaptability. Uh, but most proteins have very stable uh, backbone cores, um, and so in the field of disorder, um, disordered kind of peptides, um, emerges what we call condensates in biology. Um, so condensates are liquid droplets that exist in water. So they're liquid, liquid, phase separated um, organelles that don't have a membrane. So they're not vesicles, they're just aqueous droplets that exist in water. And they're very rel relevant to the origin of life, or I don't want to use this word, but to the, we believe, early life models, because this is how organelles emerge, not that you can um, organize things within cells through these organelles. So as I said, they don't have a membrane. They're just a liquid within a liquid. Um, and so there has been extensive research in this area. What are the design rules for um, some of these, et cetera. But the important, what is really attracting us is that to form these, you need disorder. So they're not ordered, as I said, they're not like ordered vesicles. They're just, um, you know, because of a change in viscosity, they just appear as liquids within liquids. Uh, but we're interested in actually the chemistry inside of them. So if, if nature has used them to organize or compartmentalize um, different aspects, can we do chemistry inside of them? And what does the, how is the chemistry inside these droplets different from the chemistry outside these droplets? And can we use them as nano, uh, for nano confinement or kind of nano uh, reactors? So we started uh, a little bit um, working on this. And so the, our idea was um, to use to see if you can have nanostructures within these disordered condensate. So one, um, one way to make these condensate or that is already known is if you take R9, so uh, a polyarginine made of nine arginine, and you mix it with ATP, um, these are known to form condensates uh, because of the charge complementarity between R9 and ATP actually come together in a disordered way and form condensates. So what we wanted to see is, can we have order inside these disordered uh, condensates? So the way to do this, we thought we're going to use a fiber forming motif um, taking from, uh, or taken from an amyloid uh, beta peptide, which is this motif here, LVFFA. Um, so we connect LVFFA to an R9 uh, backbone so that it's not just Floating, it actually is tethered to the R9 um, uh, component of the condensate. 
and mix them together with ATP and see if we're gonna have fibers that form inside these condensates. Um, so uh, first, just to prove that R9 and ATP form condensates, um, we, these are um, the confocal images uh, of them. So you can, uh, and they're uh, labeled with a fluorescent dye. So the fluorescent dye is inside the droplets and you can see these are spherical um, droplets. And the way to know that they are in fact liquid is to uh, use uh, fluorescence uh, recovery after photo bleaching, which basically means you just shine a very strong laser uh, on your droplet and observe if the fluorescence recovers. So if it's a liquid, the fluorescence will recover. Uh, and this is, this is the graph that you're seeing here. So uh, you measure your intensity at the beginning is one, you photo bleach it. And because it's the liquid, it um, recruits uh, more of the fluorescent dye from solution and you see fluorescence recovery. So this is how you can measure, um, how you can prove that oh, what we have is in, uh, in fact droplets. Um, so then we proceeded to um, adding different amount of the uh, fiber forming um, component. Um, so LVFFA R9. Uh, and these are confocal images. They uh, were using two different dyes. One that is uh, on the R9 component and one that is on the ATP. And so we're looking at two channels. And you can see at 5% of fiber component, we don't really see any structures. At 20%, you start seeing these um, white lines, uh, which we believe are fibers. So you're creating some fibrous morphology inside the droplet, not outside. At 50% of fiber uh, forming component, you don't see droplets. So it completely disturbs um, the droplet formation and fiber formation takes over and 100% um, is, is the same. So it's not just about having fibers in, uh, in presence of R9 or ATP, you also have to modulate how much you have in there. And um, so we did a critical aggregation concentration to see at what concentration do these fibers start forming. So the native fibers start forming, uh, so without any uh, condensates, so just taking the, the peptide, not in presence of ATP, you can see that the critical aggregation uh, con uh, concentration is around 1.4 millimolar. But when you have them inside droplets, it massively drops about 11 times to 0 0.12 millimolar, uh, which means that the presence of the droplets actually confining these fibers and making them self-assemble at even lower concentrations. This is exactly what we were kind of hoping to see, this idea of nano-confinement inside these droplets. Um, and so um, the, one of the argument was, uh, are these um, fiber containing droplets? Are they still droplets? Are they still liquid? Uh, and so we have this uh, video here. So uh, we have two uh, areas I want you to focus on. So first of all, uh, we'll look at um, this area here where you can see two droplets fusing. If this was a solid, they wouldn't fuse. Um, so, uh, I want you to look at this square here. This is a sped up video um, of I think 18 hours. And you should be able to see that the droplets um, are going to fuse soon into one big droplet. This proves that it is in fact still a liquid. Uh, the other square, unfortunately, I think is a bit too small to see on the square. I forgot to put the uh, maximized version, but what it shows is that these fibers are actually rotating inside uh, the droplet, again, showing that it is liquid. And again, we did frap on them just to show that we do still have a liquid component. But interestingly, because we have a liquid and a solid component, the recovery of the fluorescence is not 100%, as you would expect, because you have a solid component. So uh, these are the results with different, um, with different uh, percentages of the fiber component. And you can see as you increase the fiber component, um, you decrease the amount of recovery because the uh, liquid component um, decreases as well. Um, and this is a high res um, image of the fibers inside um, these droplets, which um, I think are, uh, it, it's really remarkable. Um, and it's been a, a really enjoyable um, project or aspect of the project to actually look at these things in the microscope. They're really beautiful. 
Uh, and so we also did um, characterization of uh, these fibers using um, AFM, and we're doing a bit more um, uh, characterization on them to look at their stiffness and some of their, um, their properties at the nanoscale. But um, we're really excited about this idea of being able to put order, ordered structures inside um, disordered organelles, because this opens up uh, a lot of opportunities, uh, such uh, in the areas of uh, catalysis, um, et cetera, and others. Um, so uh, it's a really exciting new direction for us um, to be working with these. Um, and so I hope that this last project, or what I talk about, kind of showed that you can actually bridge the gap between order and disorder. You can have um, you know, ordered, structured inside disordered disordered structure and this is gonna i think bridge the gap between um nanostructures and then functional and adaptive uh, properties um and so we always like to look at the the problem from these two angles um so with that i'd like to um thank thank you all for listening um thank you for the invitation uh, thank all the group. As I said, the work that I've presented, uh, some of it was done by um, uh, other people that were uh, in the group before me. So I'd like uh, to thank them and thank the funding and all of you for listening this morning. Thank you. The question was, how do we measure functionality in these dynamic peptide libraries? Is the functionality at the moment just the yield um, that is produced when we have the ATP or the glucose? Um, so the answer to this is yes. So at the moment, this is the functionality. That, that's what we're trying to show, that you have binding events. Um, and what we're exploring is what other functionalities can we, can we explore, basically? Can we do catalysis? And how would we be able to observe such things? But yes, at the moment, this is the functionality we're talking about, yes. Um, the Thomas approach seems very powerful. It needs to identify the chemical environment which is promoting process. In particular, the dissolving metal ice will be the addictive of the prebiotic environment. Organic solvents are ATP and less likely. If you have a good set of chemical conditions necessary for a population of small peptides to coexist stably in a plausible prebiotic environment, and is there an obvious concentration mechanism? For example, mineral surfaces. So should I repeat the question or? Okay, um, so uh, that's a very good question. So um, at the moment you would have noticed that we're also using an enzyme to make our peptide libraries, which um, means that we have to use a bigger protein. Um, so I would say the next step for us to be to look at these peptides um, or concentration of these dipeptides inside coracervase because inside coracervase their local yield is going to be a lot greater and that's going to more resemble um, you know uh, origin of life conditions so to speak uh, than what we're currently what we're currently doing the exploration of the conditions uh, for us is also um, to go beyond what is found in biology so you can explore properties other than what is found in biology. That was the reasoning for these, uh, for these conditions. Uh, but we haven't explored um, any uh, metal bindings um, or any conditions simply uh, because the enzyme we use is not amenable to, is amenable to some changes in conditions, but not, you know, you don't want to denature it completely. Um, so if we find a way to not have this enzyme or use, you know, more robust uh, ligation techniques, then definitely we could explore that, yeah. Right, thanks so much. Thank you.